privilege to be here and talk to you folks today. Some of you have spent some time with me in the bar, the restaurant, the beach. More time at the bar. <laughs> Probably more time at the bar, absolutely. <laughs> but not everybody's going to know uh, who I am. So I thought I'd tell you that first, who I am, how I became a real estate investor, uh, etc. Uh, let's start with, uh, I've been a real estate investor full-time since 1998. Prior to that, I was in law enforcement. I used to be a cop. Yes, believe it or not, this guy standing before you used to wear a badge and have a crew cut haircut. <laughs> I know. Move that up, please. Move that up? Yeah. Yeah. Any better? Yeah, better. Trying to keep it out of my beard. Yeah. <laughs> At any rate, for the last six years of my law enforcement career, I was assigned to the county jail. One of the most stressful jobs I've ever been near, and quite bluntly, by the end of it, I was close to being stir crazy. I was tired of trying to work overtime to make ends meet or to get ahead. Getting ahead never really seemed to happen. I mean, anybody who works nine to five with paycheck to paycheck understands you want something extra, you use a credit card and buy it, and then you pay that credit card off. Move slowly. That lifestyle just really started to grind down my nerves. And I was bored. I wasn't exercising my brain. The strongest muscle in your body is your brain. It needs constant attention, exercise, and nourishment. If you don't give it that, it's going to stagnate. So I quit. I said, the hell with it. I walked off the job one night, showed up for a midnight shift, handed my sergeant my badge, and said, I'm gone. I'm leaving. That was a week after I closed my first real estate deal and brought home $10,877. That was my salary for two and a half months as a cop. I realized I was wasting my time working in law enforcement. So when I started this study, I did just like everybody else does. I found a late night infomercial course, and then I bought it. And I worked on it, and I worked on it. And over years, I developed my own system, and that's what I'm here to share with you today. All right, obviously I'm here to talk about creative real estate today. Everybody here is here to teach you about different methods they espouse. And I will tell you this. My method, TC's method, anybody else's method is not necessarily better than the other. We all have our own systems that we've developed over the years that help us make our money, make our living, and secure our future. However, real estate has a tendency to get some folks confused as to its definition. So I'm curious, what does everybody think creative real estate means? What's that mean to you? Does it always mean no money and no credit are needed? A lot of times I speak, folks seem to think creative real estate means no money down. It doesn't. Does a seller always have to be desperate to accept your creative offer? Absolutely not. What do all creative real estate offers have in common? Does anybody have an idea? Well, when you make a creative offer to purchase and you use it properly, you're solving a seller's problem and you're also providing yourself with a profit at the same time. When those things happen, you have a deal. And the problem you're solving, 99% of the time, is debt relief. You're taking away somebody's payments, you're taking away their liability, you're taking away their problem. might not always be the root cause of the problem, but they think it is. And that's why we're there to help them with it. And, of course, take some money in the meantime. There's several different ways to buy and sell houses that accomplish debt relief. A couple of them would be things like a land contract, lease option, some cash now, some cash later. And, of course, my personal favorite, the subject to deal. That's what I'm here to talk about today, folks. When you buy a house subject to, there's no filling out a credit application. No one's going to check your credit and look at all your income. There's no income verifications. There's no giving up the right to your firstborn child. You don't have to turn over your years of personal financial records for inspection. There's no having to pay higher interest just because you're an investor. I'm sure you've all heard of conventional investors who go out and obtain a non-owner-occupied loan and their interest rate's a couple of points higher. That's ridiculous. Why am I more of a risk because I'm an investor and I'm not living in the house? Frankly, because I'm an investor and I own several properties, I'm more secure than Joe Homeowner because that's my livelihood. <coughs> if my properties aren't performing, my family doesn't eat. The best part of all, of course, you 
can do this with no money down. First thing I want to do is show you some examples of some deals I've bought subject to. There's one. Both of these houses were purchased when they were less than two years old. I didn't have to do a thing to either one of them. Nothing. People just handed them over to me. In fact, the house on the left was a father and daughter who bought the house together. They then had a falling out six months after living in the house, and both of them refused to live in it, refused to make the payments, and they just wanted to be out. So I told them, look, I can buy your house, but you've had it less than a year. There's not a ton of equity. There was. It was a fast appreciating market. <laughs> but there's not a ton of equity because you've only owned it so long. So I'm not going to step in and just buy your house. It might take me a while to find somebody to put in there as a tenant buyer or a buyer, etc. So therefore, I don't charge you a commission. You're going to have to pay the first few payments after I take possession. And those folks paid the first three or four payments after I bought that house. And the good news is I put a tenant buyer in it within two weeks. So I had some fantastic income. The sellers covered the payments and my cash flow was killer. <laughs> The house on the left was given to me by a frustrated out-of-state landlord. This was a, uh, a couple that had lived here in Florida, and they decided to let their children rent their house from them. Their children let all of their friends move in, and then the children moved out. <laughs> you can imagine what the inside looked like. It uh, really wasn't that bad. It was just dirty. Typical 18, 19-year-old kids who don't clean, and they moved out. This is a duplex on the right. This was another subject to deal. Bought this particular house, excuse me, this particular duplex from somebody who was just a burned out landlord. They were tired of managing it. Sadly, like it says on the bottom, the duplex burned down right after I sold it to somebody else. Mm. Good news is there was nobody in it at the time. They had cleared the tenants out. They were going to remodel it and raise the rent. While it was vacant, it burned. Mm. And they were insured. First house here was purchased from some folks moving into an assisted living facility. I'm going to share a tip with you folks. That's a great place to market, by the way. If you have assisted living facilities in your area, talk to the administrators, talk to the managers. A lot of times people moving into these places need to liquidate assets. They're going to be using public assistance in one form or another to pay for that, and they are not allowed to have certain dollar amounts and assets. The administrators and managers of the assisted living facilities can tell you that. And after you develop a good relationship, when they get somebody who wants to move in and needs Medicaid or whatever public aid service it is that pays for it, and they have a house to sell because they, they have an asset, they're not allowed to have that thing. So, of course, I get calls from these types of people, and they say, hey, Jim, come on over and meet Mr. and Mrs. Jones. They've got a house that they need to liquidate. They can only have X number of dollars. Certainly helps in negotiating, by the way, when you know ahead of time how much somebody can get for their home. This particular house, as you can see on the board, I paid thirty thousand dollars for it, and it was worth eighty. Mm -hmm. The good news is, my wife and one of her lovely friends went over and cleaned it out for us, and we wound up having a, an estate sale, sold off the things we didn't want, obtained some fantastic antiques, and a set of appliances. I'm an appliance hoarder. When I buy a property. I like to keep the appliances, because when somebody moves into one of my houses that doesn't have appliances, that's something I can sell them. And of course, I can sell it to them on payments. And the appliances didn't cost me a thing, because it came with my house. The second home had no mortgage. Can you buy a house subject to that has no mortgage? Absolutely. It had $8,000 in code enforcement liens. And if you look at it, you can see there's boards on the front door, which has been kicked in at that point <coughs> for my food. <laughs> and, uh, the back end of the house was covered in plywood as well. I sold this house four days after taking the deed for cash and made a quick $10,000. The day we closed and took the deed, I met the seller at a Denny's and then went to inspect the property where it was boarded up. We kicked in the door and had drug addicts diving out the back window and running from us. Oh, my goodness. Mm. I had a student with me at the time. He's a gentleman standing there in a the yellow T-shirt next to the blazer in the picture. And he was dumbfounded on his cell phone. He had to call his mother back in Pennsylvania and say, you're not going to believe what I just saw. 